A member of our church family went home to be with the Lord this past week. Um, his name was Bob Martin. You guys would recognize some people go, Bob Martin. He was our security guy, the big burly guy that you saw working back here. Uh, Bob passed suddenly uh, this past week. Um, his wife, Kim, is with us, along with their son, Derek, and his girlfriend, Annie. And uh, you guys just want to put your hand up so people know who the heck you guys are over there. They're right back there. We just want you to know, you know, the one thing that I've learned about walking with Christ is this, and as Christians, you know, the Bible doesn't say that as Christians we don't grieve, but we don't grieve the same way as everyone else because we know two things. We know where Bob is. And for those of us who are believers, we'll get to see him again. And that's the hope of our faith. That's really the crux of knowing that we are reconciled with God and that he, you know that. I mean, it's, it's amazing when you stop to think for a minute that Bob is in God's presence right now. Isn't that just, just remarkable? So for the family, I certainly would like, how about we all pray for them during this time of adjustment? So, Father... Um, we just lift the Martin family up to you, especially Kim and, and Derek. This is difficult. So, Father, please be with them. May the power of your Holy Spirit just envelop them. May they feel your arms wrapped around them like they never have before during this difficult time of adjustment that lies ahead. And all of God's people said, amen. amen. Thanks, good brother. Well, good morning, Church at the Red Door. It is a privilege. It is an absolute privilege to be with, with you today. And uh, I think Paul prayed reasonably well, but I'm going to pray one more time <clears throat> just, to, just to make doubly sure that the Lord is with us. Kidding, of course. Father, we thank you for this morning. Lord, we ask you, we invite your presence here uh, into our community today. Lord, we are in desperate need of you on so many levels relational, uh, the relational level, Lord. We, we, we just need your help in trying to discern your word. We need your help in ascertaining where we are and that we can judge ourselves rightly, as Paul said to the Corinthians. Lord, help us uh, penetrate our hearts because our hearts are, eh, it's kind of a mixed bag, Lord. We need you. We need your guidance. Uh, we thank you for this community. I thank you for this community, and I am privileged, Lord. Thank you for being able to be part of this in the 21st century. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <clears throat> well, we're going to continue our series here this morning on, uh, we've, we really launched out of, again, Psalm 96. Psalm 96 is really kind of this picture of what's going to happen a thousand years in advance of Jesus, and it's really talking about the advance of the gospel as we know it today. And so uh, we've kind of been going back and through and working through that, and it gets to a particular point in the psalm, and it talks about idolatry. So we began to work that into this concept of an Exodus template, an Exodus template. Many of you by now will have known what that is. Coming out of Egypt, for you visitors, is like the world, and then they went through the Red Sea, and that was like their baptism into the wilderness. And eventually the call on all of us, if you're a Jesus person here this morning, is to, again, cross the Jordan, move into the fullness of your calling, move into the gifting, and I began to do warfare, and, but not against physical people, but against powers and principalities, spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. We've been talking about that for now four or five weeks. And it's important to understand that we are battling in an unseen realm, and yet the weakest saint, if they're dedicated to God and they're committed to him, the power of their prayers and the effic efficacious nature of the very person of who they are with Christ in them sets all the demonic forces, uh, well, it sets them on their heels. And yet, I don't know that we really believe that. And there's a tendency in the West to just cruise. We're not cruisers. We, we want to be a church and a people who are investing our lives and actually making a difference for the kingdom. So to reiterate again what we talked about a few weeks ago, we first need to believe. That's step number one. Maybe you're here this morning and you don't believe. You're, not, you're, just not, you're just not so sure that God even exists. And then taking another step and talking about the resurrection of Jesus is, is too complicated. Well, we, this is a safe place. We want a safe place for you to be able to come and be able to ask those questions and realistically in smaller groups and certainly a Sunday morning and get involved in a group and go, I just don't know that I can believe this and at least have the conversation. 
kick the tires a little bit, begin to really do. And that's what Jesus told us to do, to really try to ascertain, well, what's, what's this going to cost? What's this all about? And he said, don't believe in me if I'm not, again, doing the works of the Father. So as you do that, you believe, and then you begin, you belong, and you become part of a community. You're not just to come and sit, and nobody knows who you are. You're part of cheers, you know, norm, welcome, for those of, you know, or whatever it is, Seinfeld, friends, like I've said before, all of our modern day, you know, the Big Bang Theory, all these things, all of our, the, the culture's crying out for connection and community, and they all want to say, and they all envision themselves now sitting, well, it used to be cheers, sitting around a beer, now it's sitting around a cup of coffee. You know, that seems to be the, and I'm happy about that, the, the millennials, you know, sitting around a cup of coffee and having a community and being able to share life. Well, then you belong. So you believe and then you belong and then the hard, arduous part comes, becoming like Jesus. <clears throat> Once you walk far enough down that, he'll begin to release you as he can trust you. He'll be, a, be able to release you into the battle, just like a new uh, person in the military, no good commander is going to send somebody who is untrained and ill-equipped into the middle of the battlefield. They're just not going to do it. They're going to let them live back behind the lines a little bit until they can, well, they can, we would call it being discipled, and then they'll be released. And so we've seen that it is, in fact, idolatry in our hearts that corrupts the process. And so how in the world are we going to go into a community and say, we, we can release you from your pain. And the pain comes from idolatry. We wouldn't call it that in modern-day secular lingo, but it's essentially what it is. You have a heart problem. How do we release others from heart problems when we ourselves still struggle with these heart problems, whatever they may be? Colossians 3, we looked at the greed is like idolatry, Paul says, and, and other things that we've been looking at. So I wanted to last week give you, begin to give you some practical steps to fight idolatry, and then the next couple of weeks we'll talk more specifically about what these specific idols are and how, again, we can battle them. But generically, in an overarching way, we talked about last week, we talked about prayer. Prayer is a first step, and we t looked at ordering our prayers in the morning. Have any of you practiced that this week, maybe wake, uh, awakened early in the morning and began to use the Lord's Prayer as a, as a template? And just begin to worship him, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. In other words, just, you're just unbelievable. Lord, you are just so fantastic, I can't comprehend you. And you just begin to tell him how extraordinary he is. Why? Because he has such a huge ego, he needs that kind of affirmation from us. No, this is for you. This allows you to recognize that you are a created being speaking to the creator. And it positions you correctly in your own mind and we move from insanity to sanity even through the process of worship and then worship would come and, and emanate from that so order our prayers that's one thing we can do and then we can also with that worship constantly be in thanksgiving so we celebrated thanksgiving but do you celebrate thanksgiving every day and so that's what we looked at last week these three things are very very helpful in beginning to rid ourselves of idolatry as i was thinking about it this week i I said, but there's more to this, practically speaking. So we have orthodoxy, trying to discern what this means, and then we have orthopraxy. In other words, how are we going to practice something that's built on this and on the integrity of the word? And so as I was thinking about it, I went to Pete and I said, well, we're going to have to have a supplement to the supplement to the original outline that was originally a supplement to Psalm 96. So we get a little lost in the process in here, but really we're not lost. Each week I say, Lord, what do you want to communicate to your people? What do you have to say for them? And if I'm not doing that, I'm not doing my job. I don't say and even remotely suggest that I get it perfect every week, but there is a sensitivity to what do the folks need? How can they be helped? Why? Second Timothy, right? It just is very simple. This is profitable for correction and reproof and training in righteousness, teaching. It's, it's so profitable so that you can do what? Come out of the world, go through your baptism, be discipled, eventually cross the Jordan and move into the very purpose for which you were created. That's our tasks anytime we open the word. If it's a group, small group leader that you're part of, uh, uh, there's a foundations women's class that uh, some of our ladies are going to kick off this in January. We've got a, a gifts class that Pastor Seifert's going to teach starting in January. Um, and, and all this starts to come together, and you go, wow, I can really be trained. I, I need to understand this path that I'm on. So if those first three, what are the other ones I want to look at? I want to first look at, 
I want to look at this. Even before we go there, I want, to, I want you to think about this for a second. There is a tendency, and I know the tendency because I was there at one point in my own walk. All right, Jeff, I mean, I get this, but I just kind of want to be saved. And this whole warfare thing and crossing and building the kingdom and all that, can I just be a saved person? Isn't it all about grace anyway and love? I mean, all this other stuff, it just seems so, I don't know. I, I'm just saved. I just want to know, I want to make sure I'm saved. And as long as I'm saved, I'm pretty much okay. What is grace about? And, and I think we have that in our Western culture. You know, we, we know Ephesians 2. We talked about it at length. You're saved by grace through faith. Charis is the Greek for grace. And what is it? It's this eff- effecting of bringing sweetness and beauty and moral purity and all these things that come graciously from God. This grace is the impacting of that. It's that which affords pleasure and joy and delight and sweetness and loveliness and favor. It's just all those things that come from God. Grace is really something that's unmerited. It just God just begins to pour it out. How's he going to pour it out on you if you're enslaved to idolatry? If you're enslaved by greed, what would be a gracious thing that God would do to bring sweetness and generosity and purity into your life, that he would remove that from your heart? And that's a process, and it's not easy, so it takes work. Number one, it takes, after we talked about order in our prayers, worship and thanksgiving, we want to look at a deep sensitivity to the leading of the Holy Spirit. So we're going to look at that, but what is it? What is it that grace is supposed to do? That's my question to you. If you have your Bibles Titus 2.12, and I want you to remember this forever. You need to catch this. This is important because grace is not just, well, he saves us, and it's really not, doesn't have anything to do with us. There's that. Well, there's an element of truth to that. He does do the saving, but you've got to understand what is grace then? What is it? It's him bringing the sweetness and his beauty into your life, and it involves you. What does it do? It instructs us. So Titus 2, 11, we'll start in verse 11, Titus 2, 11. I think the screen behind me started in 12, but let's look at 11, Titus 2, 11. So <clears throat> what does it teach us to do? For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. So it brings us salvation for sure. But what, is the, what does then the grace do? It instructs us. To deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. What does grace do? What does it do? Epithemui, right? No. What is it? It's this, it's this Greek word, epithumia. And it's worldly. It's the same lust that we've been talking about. It's based in idolatry. It's disordered passions, it's disordered passions. We have our passions out of order. And that, those are these worldly desires. So grace saves us, but then it instructs us that we don't have to live like that anymore. It begins to release us and help us move away from all these passions that we had that we were so intent on, and yet I know they still exist in my life. And the Lord is so gracious to help me one thing at a time, beginning to remove these from my heart so I can order my passions and love the right things. So how do we do that? Well, we have to have guidance by the Holy Spirit. You know, Isaiah prophesying some 700 years in advance of Jesus, 700 years plus, prophesied something extraordinary. And we've looked at it in here before, but we're going to look at it in the context of idolatry. Isaiah chapter 30, one of my favorite passages. This is very impa- has been very impactful for me because I think often many of you may be out there and go, oh, we've got to make sure we're as- ascribing to the right religion, to the right, uh, to the right denomination within Christianity, and I'm not so sure, and I've got to make sure, and uh, I don't want to miss this up. Look, this was always talking about it's not going to be that, it's going to be this. It's simply listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit had not been poured out, but it's picturing a day when he would be poured out very powerfully. It was looking at Pentecost. Joel had seen it. We looked at it during the, the vision presentation in here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, there's going to be dreams and visions. I'm going to pour out my spirit upon all mankind. And what's, it gonna, what's gonna happen? Well, Isaiah was seeing this with some great specificity. Listen to what he says. Verse 18 of Isaiah 30. Therefore, the Lord longs to be gracious to you. I want you to stop for a second. Do you believe that? He longs 
to be gracious to you, to pour out his grace on you. He longs to do that. He wants to see sweetness and beauty and clarity and delight and loveliness emerge in your life. He longs to do it. Well, how's he going to do it? And therefore, he waits on high to have compassion on you. Notice him waiting for a response from us. For the Lord is a God of justice. How blessed are those who long for him. We'll see that more in a minute. Do you long for God? Do you long for his ways? Do you, are you desperately seeking his ways? He longs to pour out loveliness and beauty and, and orderliness and seeing things go from dysfunctional to functional and attitudes and marriages and everything. He longs to do that. But he's waiting on high for you to long for him. And then he says this. O people of Zion. Now, the direct context is the people of Israel, but we understand that Israel was a template for us, all of us as believers. O people in Zion, inhabitant in Jerusalem, you will weep no longer. This is this grace being poured out. He will surely be gracious to you at the sound of your cry when he hears it. He will answer you. All the Lord has given you bread of privation and water of oppression. He, your teacher, will no longer hide himself. I believe that the fullness of this came 700 years later when Jesus came. He was the teacher, and they could actually see him. And then he says, but your eyes will behold your teacher. And then people talk about the Trinity all the time. Well, I don't know about the Trinity, and is that in the Bible? Well, look here. It says, your ears will hear a word behind you. This is the way. Walk in it. This is a picture of the Holy Spirit. So, again, as I was teaching a, a group of men this Thursday, uh, Jesus is that part of, of the Godhead. God creates through Jesus, but he speaks and guides by the Holy Spirit. So here right now, you already have a picture of, of, of a visible teacher, and you have a picture of a spirit guiding you behind you. You hear a word behind you. That's the Holy Spirit. And all this compassion the Father is wanting to pour out on you. So in other words, the, the Father is wanting you to engage with a visible teacher, which he was only visible 2,000 years ago for about 33 and a half years, and maybe only three, three and a half years with his ministry. But that was Jesus. And now the, to be hearing a word behind you. Go this way. No, don't go that way. Go this way. Don't treat her like that. Treat, go, go this way. You go apologize. You... Now, that, you're greedy in this area. No, you're loving the wrong thing. You're so focused on this. You're so caught up in this that you can't see what I'm saying to you. I'm asking you. All this is going on in your head, and you're like, I never used to have these thoughts. I, I, for years, I know my own experience, I never had those thoughts. And then the Holy Spirit came in, and I began to have these thoughts. Where do you think those thoughts come from? Well, there's going to be a voice behind you. No, no, go this way. Don't go that way. What are you don't do that. Do this. Now notice, your ears will hear a word behind you. This is the way. Walk in it. Whenever you turn to the right or to the left, and you will defile your graven images overlaid with silver and your molten images plated with gold, you will scatter them as an impure thing and say to them, be gone. I don't have time for greed anymore. I don't have time for this addiction anymore. I don't have time for this kind of self-focus. I don't have time for this anymore because Jesus is calling me into something deeper, more profound. He, he wants me to become like him, and eventually he wants me to build his kingdom and so that er heaven can come to earth and his kingdom. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. What? On earth as it is being done in heaven. Your will, your ways, Lord. And, and this is just a picture. For them, it was an actual idol with gold and overlaid with gold. For us, it's, but it was the same thing. It's a reflection of the human heart as we saw a few weeks ago. Their idols were the same thing as ours. They wanted the same things from their idols that we want from our whatever today. But there's coming a day when the Holy Spirit's going to come and you're just going to say, be gone. I'm just, I don't want to live that way anymore. I don't want to be that person anymore. Isn't that beautiful? Of course, Jesus said the same thing in John 14. I, I could be here, and I could be your visible teacher here. I could, I could be that. Boy. But it's, he was actually looking back, I think, to Isaiah 30. He says, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things 
and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. In other words, Jesus was like, it's better that I go away because I'm going to send the Holy Spirit and he's going to be able to be with each one of you at all times, 24-7, that little voice in the back of your head, no, 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 don't do that, go this way. Now, many times we know that we, we know, we sense the Spirit's voice and it says go left and we still go right. And there's always a penalty to pay for that. And the Lord doesn't love you less for that. But he knows there's going to be, and there's a discipline that can come in that as well. We, we all make those decisions. He tells us to do something, but deep down we, we cling to our will so tenaciously. So how, what is one of the great steps in eradicating idolatry? Well, it says right here, we're going to hear a voice. We're going to see our teacher first. He's going to teach it, and then a voice is going to come, turn to the left, turn to the right. And then we're going to look at those idols, and we're going to say, just be gone. I don't have time for this anymore. It's like they said in Nehemiah, we don't have time to come down. We're building these walls. We don't have time for your silly business down here. We're about the Lord's business in here. And when that begins to happen and you become so kingdom focused, you're going to find that these idols begin to slip away. You're just not going to care about them anymore because you're going to have a new passion. You're not just going to go around all the time going, I can't do this and I can't do that. And I can't. What a way to live. What a beautiful way to live. You get up in the morning and go, boy, I sure would like to do this, but I can't do that. And then I would like to do this, but I can't do that. And then I would love to do that, but I can't do that either. And you finish the day. What a glorious day I experienced. Wasn't that just fantastic? I didn't do this and this and this and this. And you sound like, all of a sudden, you sound like a religious Pharisee. The Lord is not calling you into a life where you can't, can't, can't. He's just calling you to a different life. And for some of you, and this is important, anytime you've got to go to something new, you're going to necessarily have to leave something else. And that's what he's calling us away from. He's calling us away from being led by our own will and into the will of the Father through the Spirit because he speaks to us by his Spirit. Number two. It's also important, by the way, that we, we learn to love God above all else. It's loving God, which is a heart issue. We've got to set our love and affection on God. And yet, let's be honest, that's hard at times to even understand, isn't it? I mean, he's out there. It's not like someone you can bring into your home and, and sit down with and see and have a conversation back and forth, especially if you don't know the word or you're not accustomed to prayer. Some of you will say, well, this is very natural for me. I, I'm constantly having a conversation. Even Paul said that. You know, I pray without ceasing, but let's be honest, most, most of us just aren't there. And this is... it. Sounds kind of glorious, but then we leave and practically, what does that even look like? How do we set our affection and love on God? How do we do that? Well, first of all, we need to know a little something about the human heart. Let's just all come down to a base place of understanding. Jeremiah 17, many of you will know it well, 17, 9. The heart is more deceitful. Now, what is the heart, by the way? It's the seedbed of our mind, our will, and our emotions, And there's some technicalities, and some people disagree on exactly the soul versus the heart versus the mind and all. But generally speaking, we can just say the heart is the seedbed of our, our, it's our soul, it's our mind, will, and it's our emotions. The heart is more deceitful than all else, and it's desperately sick. Who can understand it? Well, really, only, only God can understand our heart because we don't understand it properly. In fact, the language, the very language we use often is a reflection of our inability to understand the depths of wickedness of our heart. Now, there's a promise that there's going to be a new heart, and we'll see that in a minute. I love Andy Stanley's book, Enemies of the Heart, and he, he, gets, it, he gets right down to it. He says, listen to what he says. He says, has this ever happened to you? You say something that's entirely Now catch this, out of character for you, and you cover your mouth as if to say, I can't believe I just said that. Only me. Uh, Perhaps you even say, where did that come from? I can't believe that just came out of my mouth. People look at you like, yikes, where did did that come from? I I thought he was supposed to be a Christian, you know, or a pastor or a small group leader, or, you know, whatever. So where did that come from? You don't know? You want to take a wild guess? So do you think that outburst was an exception? And in one way, it was. It was an exception to your general rule of not allowing what's in your heart to be exposed to the rest of the world. But as we'll discover in the next chapter... That embarrassing outburst wasn't an exception to what's in your heart. Indeed, it was a reflection of what's really swirling around down there. 
We've all grown very adept at covering for our hearts. In fact, we're as good at it as most of us. Well, we have no idea just how corrupt we really are, but every once in a while, our hearts go public. And we swear we didn't mean it, but the truth is we just didn't mean to say it. Are you with me? I mean, I, all, it's, a, it's a human experience. We have a new heart, and yet we have, and that, again, that's the Romans 7. There's this battle. There's this, so if, if you're ever going to rage in the battle that is external to you after crossing the Jordan and actually building the kingdom, don't you think you should have probably addressed some of the primary battles that are swirling around on the inside of you first? Probably so. Probably so. It's also interesting. He taught, he says, this is this, this. I worked with high school students for 15 years, and I can't remember all the times I counseled parents whose kids had gotten into some kind of trouble. Inevitably, mom and dad would say something like, he's such a good kid. He's got a good heart. He just got into a little trouble. Wrong, Andy says. Yes, he's a cute kid, and he's a talented kid, but he's not a good kid. Good kids do good things, kind of like pear trees produce pears. The reality was their child's heart was fouled up. Every one of these kids had a heart problem, not just a behavior problem. And the parents who recognized the root problem and responded accordingly were always rewarded with improvement in their child's behavior. But the parents who wouldn't allow themselves to face the painful truth found themselves dealing with the same kinds of issues over and over again. Putting a kid on restriction does nothing for his or her heart. It only delays further misadventures. Can you relate to that? So I think the important part to understand is that our heart is in process. And I don't care how long you've been walking with Jesus, there are moments when you go, I cannot believe that's swirling down around in there. And people around you are like, oh. But typically the people who don't know you. Isn't that the truth? So what, what do we do about this? Well, I love Jude 20 and 21. It says, but you, beloved building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus to eternal life. Did you catch that? Keep yourselves in the love of God. That is an active, participatory thing you do. Hopefully this morning is helping you keep yourself in the love of God. I mean, you've got an opportunity to worship. You've got an opportunity to be with one another, to encourage one another. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Prayer, ordering your prayer helps. If you get up every single day and you go, oh, hallowed be thy name. You don't have to say hallowed, but you can say you're just glorious. God, you're just unbelievable. I, I know I'm going through this problem, but I trust that even this problem I'm going through, this maybe as heinous a problem as I've ever been going through, and yet... I trust who you are. You are the creator. I'm the created. From dust I came to dust I will return. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You are unbelievable. I know you have extraordinary plans for my life. And you sent your son. I know you love me. And you just go on and on and on. And you, and you start your day that day. Every, every, that's keeping yourself in the love of God. You want to be practical about this? You want, you want an orthopraxy? It's this. Keep yourself in the love of God. It's one of the things... It, that is my highest privilege as a pastor is to meet with you when I get the opportunity to meet with you individually or in smaller groups and look you right in the eye. And, and I can honestly say that God loves you. You keep loving him back. He loves you so much and he's waiting to pour out his grace on you. Well, you just move into his love, move into his love. And, but one person can't do that. Even a pastoral staff, an executive team, a whole... You need to do that to the person next to you. You need to do that close, you know, just continue constantly. Will we keep ourselves in the love of God? Will we? That's the question. You know, Proverbs 4, verse 23, many of you will know it well. I'm going to uh, quote it from the message, actually, because not because I don't like the NASB here. I just think it brings some real profundity to the moment. It says, keep vigilant watch over your heart, or the NASB, watch over your heart. That's where life starts, it says, don't talk out of both sides of your mouth. Avoid careless banter, white lies, gossip. Just come on. Shouldn't we be saying be gone to that kind of stuff? The little white lies we used to tell and all. Shouldn't we be past that yet? 
It's just idolatry. It emerges from idolatry. We're protecting something that we don't think we can live without. Therefore, we think we have to fudge the truth as an example. Keep your eyes straight ahead. Ignore all the sideshow distractions. Ignore them. Watch your step. And the road will stretch out smooth before you. Look neither right nor left. Now, how are we going to get that? Holy Spirit, just turn to the left. Turn to the right. Ah, oh, yes. You don't have to figure all this out. I'm not that smart. I can barely get through an hour. How should I respond to that person? Who, should I call them back? Should I wait? Should I, you know, I've got four meetings now, and then, but maybe I should need to skip this meeting and call you. I don't even know how to navigate this. Lord, just what do you want? I, I trust that you will give me guidance, that you'll help me with my motivations, that you'll change my heart. Lord, just I'm going to watch over my heart. I'm just, going to, I'm just going to one step in front of the other. I'm not going to worry about tomorrow. I'm not going to get too far ahead of you on this, Lord. I, 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 just, I just want you. I want your will. There's a, there's a certain relaxation in that, isn't there? I mean, think about it. I don't have to figure everything out. We've got a five-year plan, a 10-year plan, a this, a that, that, that. I mean, I don't, I'm not against planning because there's certain wisdom in planning. But it's not going to just dominate my life. If the Lord says, no, don't go to that meeting, call that guy and go have coffee with him, I don't know what that means, but I've, I've acted on that. And can I tell you, this is one of the invigorating things. Once you start listening to the voice and responding, even if it is at the moment appears sacrificial or challenging or something you don't want to do, when you do it, the supernatural unfolds in front of you. And all of a sudden, you get more excited about living in that world than you did about doing whatever you were going to do in the first place. That probably was built around idolatry in the first place. If I don't do that, I'm not going to get that, which is going to make me happy. Wait a minute. Following the Holy Spirit's voice is what's going to make you happy. And the most invigorating thing in life is to be recognized that you're engaged with a supernatural force that's actually guiding you. At me, those of you who were here for the presentation, does that not blow your mind? You know, the, the house with the, the pointy white and this and that and all that comes together. You don't see that if you're not listening to the voice, if you're not watching over your heart. Sometimes you can't hear the voice because you haven't watched over your heart. You haven't kept yourself in the love of God. You're still after these other things that in the end will disappoint you. That's the point. Don't let that happen. It's not the kind of life you want to lead. Now, some of you have never experienced any of this. Sounds kind of cool, but I don't know if I can go there. I don't know if he'll be there. Test and see that the Lord. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Just, just try. You say, well, I don't even understand it well. And we'll get involved in a foundations group. Get involved in, a, get involved in something. We can start actually learning the word. Keep coming on Sundays. Hopefully, I'm up here plagiarizing and that's the best thing for you when everything I get is right out of here, not just a bunch of ideas that I've come up with. Who cares? So we do. We love the wrong things. Listen to what John Piper says. Again, I'm a big John Piper fan. He says, holiness is not as much an avoidance issue as it is an affection issue. What are you loving? We make a God out of whatever we find most joy in. i say that again. We find joy in something and we, okay, the most important thing in my life is this relationship with this person. You'll, you'll crush that person, whether it be a marital or a friendship or something, because at some point your friend will let you down. They'll, they'll go out to dinner with somebody else and you think you should have been invited, yada, 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 on and on and on. Somewhere you'll be crushed. God will never crush you. He will never crush you, ever. He may not do your bidding at all times, but he'll never crush you. So find your joy in God and be done with all idolatry. That's as simple as that. Live in the love of God. Now, thirdly, we obviously, and we talk about this all the time, but you have to stay connected to his body. And that's what really stokes the flames of this. I, I need you. You need one another. We, we, we so desperately need one another to keep going, come on, stay in the love of God. You don't need that, brother. Sister, you don't... You, you don't need to love that anymore. That's not, in the end, that's not going to give you the kind of joy that you think you're going to get. But I'm kind of miserable with it. What will I be without it? Well, you'll be less miserable. 
But that's kind of what goes on in our own hearts. Hebrews 10, verse 23, and we, again, we've quoted this many times. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful and let us consider. Let's, let's think about this. That's what this means. Come on, let's think about this. Let's deeply think about it. How are we going to stimulate one another to love and good deeds? Pattern them, encourage people when they do something well. I mean, how are we going to do that? Not forsaking our own assembling together. It's the habit of others, but encourage one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. We need to come together. So, look, some of you had, a, I'm just telling you right now, some of you had a really bad week. Devastating week. I, I mean, obviously, Kim and Derek and family here. I mean, it was a tough week. Some of you had an awful week. And I'm just telling you, we want you to come and say the Lord loves you. He cares for you. And yeah, some weeks are even ordained by God as, from your perspective, being a bad week. But in his, from his view, it may not be such a bad week. Maybe a glorious week because he's... Ir- He's removing some idolatry from your own heart. Who knows? I'm just encouraging you. Come on. He loves you. He's got extraordinary plans for your life. He wants you to walk in the supernatural. He doesn't want you to just be a religious person. He wants you to know him, hear his voice, and then see this just unbelievable things arise out of this relationship that he has with you. Don't settle for anything less. And we need each other to help each other be encouraged. 2 Timothy 2, 22 Notice again the context of idolatry. Now flee youthful lusts. Again, what are the youthful lusts? Epithumia. Again, that word, lust, these desires, these things we set our hearts on. He says, flee those and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. Catch this. With those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. You got to be doing this with others. And they say this about everything, you know. You want to exercise, this sometimes is really hard to do, but if you get part of an exercise class, I don't know if that's true or not, but they say, you know. Or if you're struggling with an addiction, if you can go with other people who are kind of struggling with the same thing, there's some power in coming together. There's a certain accountability. There's all Just do it with people who are also trying to see their heart purified. It just is, it's wonderful. Do not be a lone ranger. Pretty simple. Proverbs 13, 20. He who walks with wise men and women will be wise. Do you prioritize that? Do you value that? Do you seek out wise people, not just wise guys? Seek them out. Man, if I could get 30 minutes with her, I, we have some women in this church, ladies. I'm just telling you, there's some women in this church that carry so much wisdom and so much insight your lives could be extraordinarily changed because of the word that lives in them that can be transferred to you. I want to encourage you. Men, same thing. We have some extraordinary leadership in this church. You have no idea. Just 30 minutes with them. Just ask them. Find people. Say, can we have coffee? I'll buy you coffee. I'll buy you some eggs. I'll, I'll do whatever. Let's meet. I just I want to take it all in. There's some extraordinary people sitting probably right around you if you take advantage of it. But somehow we just, you want to be wise, you want to grow, you want to know how to walk this walk, walk with people that are a little further ahead than you. I'm so thankful. We have, I was even out in the foyer and uh, Pastor Seifert was there and they, they've built numerous churches and some days I get up and I just feel like, oh gosh, how's this ever going to happen? I mean, we told him we were going to do this and then I, I, Lord, I just, and then I s- calm myself down. But I, I told him, I said, I said, Dave, we, we've got to get together and just, you've seen churches built and you just miraculous how this thing happens and I just need some faith. He's been there, I haven't. He's wise. I'm not as wise as he is as it relates to something like this, this season of my life. Thank God he's there. I cherish those people and the, those moments that I can have. Are you that intentional about connecting? Please do. Psalm 106, they did not destroy the people and the, as the Lord commanded them. Notice, they went into, they crossed the Jordan. They were supposed to eradicate all this idolatry, but they didn't do it. They mingled with the nations. Stop for a second. Are any of you here, and I don't, do not raise your hand, raise it in your own heart. Are you still mingling with the nations? Isn't it time to just be saying, be done, be gone? Enough of that. I don't need to do that anymore. I don't need to make that connection anymore. 
I mean, it sounds kind of, oh, well, maybe I'll share the Lord with them. But deep down, you're like, I can't wait to get to Vegas and be party with my boys, right? And, you know, I'll bring Jesus with me. Well, maybe if he calls you to do that, but chances are if you're a young believer or just starting and you're not having, you don't even know what the armor of God is and all that, and you're not being called to be a missionary in Las Vegas, chances are you just say, guys, it's probably better that I don't do that this weekend. But I love you guys. Let's get together for coffee next week, and I want to talk to you about something. Maybe that, maybe that's the direction. I don't know. I don't want to be too overly hyper, you know, holier than thou kind of thing, but there's a certain point that you just don't mingle with the nations. Why? Because they're, they're filled with idolatry. They don't know it's idolatry. They cling to things that you don't need to be clinging to anymore because it's never going to pay off for you, and it's only going to drag you down in your purposeful advancement towards becoming like Jesus and then eventually building his kingdom. Don't do it. And they learned their practices. Well, if you're mingling with the nations, you're going to learn their practices. And they serve their idols. Notice, it starts with a little mingling. Then you kind of just, it just kind of comes and you just kind of learn their practices. You don't even know you're learning it. And all of a sudden you've got the same idol. You're worshiping the same idol. They, what they're doing is say, this is important. This is important. This is important. This is going to bring joy. And deep down you're going, well, I don't think it will, but maybe it will. And then all of a sudden you're just caught up in that same thing. Be cautious who you hang with. That's as simple as that. And it became a snare to them and it will to us as well. And even sacrifice their sons and daughters to the demons and shed innocent blood. Now you say, we would never do that. Uh, really? Do we not have abortion in this land? Millions and millions and millions of children have been sacrificed to the God of pleasure. Whatever it is, millions and millions and millions. We still sacrifice them. We just don't go out to a great idol. Now, ladies, let me just tell you, anytime I talk about this, you need to know there is absolute forgiveness and joy and everything at the foot of the cross. And if you have gone through an abortion, there's no way you can have a group like this, and you have gone through an abortion, let me tell you something. The Lord is there in his fullness to both forgive you and move you into a place of great grace and beauty. But you need the cross. You don't just get a better attitude about it. And you need to be open about, you know, maybe why that occurred. Let's just be transparent with ourselves the blood of their sons and daughters whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan and the land was polluted with the blood. And thus they became unclean in their practices and played the harlot in their deeds. Remember, slowly they mingled, they learned, and then they began to worship. Now, we would never use that language now, but we know it's true. So as I hang around those who are high, highly value the kingdom and the ways of Jesus, I just want to be around those who are dedicated to his plans and his glory. Do you? I mean, is that... It should become increasingly important to you in your walk with Jesus. If you find that's not that important to you, go back to a heart issue. Don't just say, well, he's still a good guy and he's saved by grace and all that. That's true. All that's true. But let's get to the core issues here. It's a heart issue. It's a heart issue. Lastly, I want to just say, look, keeping God, this is a balance to this because this is tough, man. It's like, man, your heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? And and now, and now you get hit over the head with, I'm not, you know, connecting with those people. And then you get hit over the head. Oh, no, man, this has been a tough sermon. Well, just always balance this with the following. Romans 5, 5. Hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. The Holy Spirit will continue to pour out the love of God in us. You say, yeah, I don't love the Lord enough. I don't know that I love. I don't have this passionate desire for God. I just don't. I want to maybe, but I don't even know really what that would look like. The Holy Spirit pours out the love of God in your heart. You know, it's a beautiful prayer. Holy Spirit, I'm asking you, would you pour out the love of God in my heart? What a beautiful way to pray. I struggle to pray. Here's what you can pray. Holy Spirit, pour out compassion and passion right? His compassion towards me and passion towards, back towards him because of his compassion. Lord, just pour it out in my heart. Holy Spirit, pour this out in my heart. Some people get waylaid along the way. Maybe that's you here this morning. Again, listen to John Piper. I love this. Many of us are weary in our communion with God. You know why? Because we've passed over this essential foundation to our communion. Catch this. Our faith is on a 24-7 mission to find rest for our souls. It really is. Mine is. And many of us are restless because we struggle to simply see him as loving. He's always the guy that's kind of deep down ticked off at you. You think if he walked into a room, he'd walk to the other side of the room. No, he wouldn't. He'd walk straight towards you. 
Are you saved by the blood of Jesus? Have you applied the blood to the doorposts of your house? If he does, Jesus would come straight towards you. I don't care what state you're in, he would come straight towards you. Now catch this. Again, he's talking about John Owen, one of the great Puritan writers, rightly notes, every discovery of God without this will but make the soul fly from him. If you're discovering God but without the loving nature of God, you eventually will fly from him. Why? Catch it. Why will every other discovery of God result in this flying from him if we don't see and receive his love for us? If his sovereignty and authority were at work against us and not for us through his love, we would all fly and hide from him. We would buckle under the weight of living to gain his approval versus just living life as approved sons and daughters. There's this paradox. Yes, we've got to put away idolatry. We're, we're involved in the process. Why? Because we believe it's going to lead to life and liberty and salvation, not just eternal, I'm going to go to heaven and not go to hell kind of stuff. I mean, saving me today. If, but if I don't stay and recognize, even when I struggle, that God still loves me, somehow my soul began to fly from me. You know how many people I meet on the streets? They started something. They just, all they did, did you can read this book with a legalistic heart, and all you do is it just feels like just, it just, <laughs> you know, it's just, oh, God, it just beats me up. And eventually, you just fly, you just kind of start to fly away. And we need the Holy Spirit to pour out the love of God in our hearts. Holy Spirit, pour out the love of God. Help us understand that this, yes, it's, it's a disciplining aspect to the word. It's a two-edged sword, but oh, Lord, but it, it still says it's a love letter too. Don't forget that. We've got to be balanced in that. Ezekiel 36, we'll close with this. Again, now, th this is about 600 years before the time of Jesus, for those of you who are new to your Bible. This is what God says he's going to do. Now, catch this. It's powerful. He says, I'm going to take you from the nations, okay? In other words, outside the community of faith and inside. For them, it was Israel, and the nations were. Now, for us, it's outside the kingdom into the kingdom. That's our application here. I'm going to gather you from all the lands, and I'm going to bring you into your own land. I'm going to do this. God says he's going to do this. Then I'm going to sprinkle clean water on you. I'm going to do it. He's doing that right now, by the way. This is the living word. You're being washed with the water of the word, except for the two people that are asleep up there. And it says, <laughs> and I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. Let's stop for a second. I'm going to, I'm going to do this. I'm going to sprinkle clean water. I'm going to take you. I'm going to bring you into a land. And I'm going to sprinkle clean water on you. I'm going to do that. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all of your what? Idols. idols. I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going to, I'm going to help reconstruct your heart. Okay? Moreover, I'm going to give you a new heart. I'm going to put a new spirit in you. Oh, wow. And I'm going to remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Now, I, don't, when I have Jewish friends... And I share this with them. This is in your Tanakh. This was written hundreds of years before Jesus. This is Jesus. I mean, this is the Holy Spirit. This is, this is the nations. Nations are, every nation rises up. There's people from every nation. Germany, Austria, Spain, Portugal, all over the African continent, South America. Everybody, I've got a new heart. I've got, I hear this voice in my head behind, turn to the left, turn to the right. It's changing my life. I'm, I'm starting to walk into whole thousands upon thousands of the last 2,000 years. Millions upon millions would say, this has happened in my life. Put my spirit with you, and I'm going to cause you to walk in my statutes. And you will be careful to observe my ordinances. You will live in the land. Notice now. So once we cross that Jordan, right? You're going to live in the land that I gave to your forefathers. Our forefathers are not just literal Israel, but our forefathers are all the spiritual fathers of faith. So you will be my people, and I'm going to be your God. Sounds good, doesn't it? Moreover, I'm going to save you from all of your uncleanness. Now, when I get, I got to understand, I know what's in my heart at times. I don't know all that's in my heart, because there's some stuff down in there swirling around sometimes, and I go, I don't like that. And I'm just... And that's why I've always been trying to be pretty transparent with you because I'm not like, okay, he's arrived because he's our pastor and he's got everything figured. Now, I've still got some stuff swirling around here that sometimes comes out of my mouth, at least comes into my head. 
and I don't like what I see, and I have to go back here and I'm saying, but Lord, here's what you've done. You are sprinkling, giving me a new heart, putting a new spirit. You're cleaning me up from my uncleanness. And then you're going to call for the grain and multiply it, and I'm not going to bring famine on you. That's a spiritual famine. Let's not take it so literally. I will multiply the fruit of the tree and the produce of the field so that you won't receive again the disgrace of famine among the nations. Then you will remember your evil ways and your deeds that were not good. Now, catch this, and this is important. This is our close. You ready? Okay. Then you will loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and your abominations. Now, it's kind of harsh. I came to be lifted up today, and here's what my pastor says. You're going to loathe yourselves. Well, first of all, I didn't say it. God, through the inspiration of the, spoke through Ezekiel. But I will tell you, that has become true in my own life. The longer I walk with the Lord, the more I loathe the life that I have lived in the past. Let me say that again. The closer I get to him, another way of saying it, the closer I get to him, the further away I realize I always was from him. The closer I get to him and understanding his ways, the more I realize I've caused pain in other people's lives. But he doesn't leave me in a place of loathing and horror. It's just a recognition of what he's called me out of. He leaves me with grace and purity and beauty. But there is a place when I look back, sometimes I see things and pain that I've caused in people's lives. And probably am still causing in those close to me at times when I'm unable to connect and see and be led by the Spirit. There are those moments... And I'm, I'm, there's just, it doesn't, and maybe in five years I'll look back and loathe some things that I'm doing today that I wish I wouldn't have. But, you know, it's also the human experience. But we continue to press on towards the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. It says, I'm not doing this for your sake, declares the Lord. Let it be known to you. Be ashamed and confounded in your ways, O house of Israel. Now catch this and we'll close. Thus says the Lord God, on the day that I cleanse you from all your iniquities, Here's what we were talking about a couple of weeks ago. I will cause the cities to be inhabited. Don't you want to be in an inhabited place? Uh, I just was flipping through last night. It was kind of, I dozed off, and I think it actually came. I don't even think I was pursuing it. It just kind of came up, and it was, the television was on. It was this ridiculous thing about leaving Los Angeles or something. It was, an, it was an apocalyptic time. It was back in the 90s that this thing was created. It was the year 2013, which is hilarious. But this apocalyptic, you know, kind of thing thing and it was I don't know it was slapstick in some ways but strange but we get a lot of that apocalyptic future kind of thing and it, they're always uninhabited cities and there's this mayhem you know in the future apocalyptic world post whatever but we want an inhabited city don't you love coming here and just being loved on and having it feel there's a lot of life here and Jesus is working through one another and loving one another praying for one another. don't you love that that's an inhabited city that's what he wants to give us and the waste places will be rebuilt. Those places that you've just wasted your life, he wants to rebuild those. Those mistakes that you've made, you're just like, I can't even believe. Well, I'm going to rebuild that. I'm going to restore that. That's why I kind of love that little house on our hill on our property. Anybody else would bulldoze that thing. Anybody. We're going to keep it. It's going to be a centerpiece. It's going to be a God story for all the years to come. Why do they keep that little house up on that hill? Well, they totally restored it. Somehow that'll be a picture on a hill of restoration. I hope it is. Walter White and architecture. I don't know about all that. I don't know anything about that. But somebody called me and said, it's just like God to restore something rather than just tearing it down and eradicating it. He says, the desolate land will be cultivated instead of being a desolation. And they will say, this desolate land has become like a garden of Eden. Wow. Wow. And the waste, the desolate and ruined cities are fortified and inhabited. Don't you realize that when you return to the Garden of Eden, you realize that's all I ever needed in the first place? I didn't need all this other stuff that I thought if I didn't have that, I'd be miserable. Remove the idolatry from our hearts. So in this process, folks, are there mountains and valleys and all that? Oh, you cannot believe. The, the walk with Jesus is always upwards, but there. There are moments in the valleys, but can I just tell you, the valleys are as a constructive, if not more so, than the mountaintops. They tend to be that way. Would you agree? 
So if the Lord is doing something in your heart through this series, like, I am greedy. Well, that's what he's been doing to me. You know, you're greedy. He, he, I just felt like the Holy Spirit. You know, you don't think about money all the time and this and that. I got to, you know, blah, 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 and how we retire and all that other kind of stuff. Forget it. Somebody has a need, fill it. And trust me with it. I mean, you, it, it's just it's things like that, and it feels like a valley. I'm just a ministry guy, and I'm down here, and I'm just I'm an ungenerous person. This is horrible. I don't want that. Be gone. I don't need that anymore. Listen to the voice. Where will I give? How will I give? How, how will I give? More of my time. More of my... I want to be in love with the right things, and it starts with your love of God. Idols be gone. Don't need them anymore. But it's an arduous place. And maybe you're in that valley now. The Lord's doing something deep in your heart, and you're like, man, does that hurt? <laughs> it will lead to a mountaintop. If you want to get to that mountaintop over there, what are you going to have to do? You're going to have to walk through the valley to get to that mountaintop. And if you're on a mountaintop, chances are if you keep walking and our walk is always forward, chances are you probably walk down into a valley again and then work back up to a mountaintop. Is God in the mountains and the valleys? Well, let's close with this worship song and I'll come back up and close this in prayer. Think about the words here. Some beautiful, beautiful God creation part of this. But he's in the mountains, he's in the valleys, he's everywhere. Let's, let's worship.